Thanks, Sophie. You're watching Southeast Today. Our top story tonight. The brother of a teenager killed in a high-speed crash calls for action to stop young men driving dangerously. This collision will, will stay with me for forever. It's probably one of the worst ones I've, I've, I've been to and I've seen. Traffic chaos is predicted with an unprecedented closure of the M25 this weekend in Surrey. The full support of the government in a bid to ban puppies and kittens being smuggled through our ports. Will it be a sunny start to the cricket season or will fans be left in a spin if rain stops play? Our sports reporter James will bring us all the very latest. What can I see? A big patio area with all grass. And escaping reality, why VR headsets are helping to distract patients during minor operations. Hello, welcome to the programme. I'm Ellie Crissell. The brother of a 19-year-old who died in a high-speed crash is calling for action to stop young men from killing themselves and others behind the wheel. A BBC investigation has found young men are far more likely than other drivers to be convicted of dangerous or careless driving. One teenager from Sussex told us he lost his licence on the very day he passed his driving test after crashing his car. Claudia Sebasis reports on the growing problem of young male speeding drivers. When I talk about my floor, I mean the frequency. Running through our bodies very secretly. Rapper Ned Price learned to drive when he was 17. He was ecstatic when he finally passed his test, but on the same day, he rolled his car on the A3. Just a bit overexcited, really, I think, which is the main problem. And uh, there was that turning over there. I think I'm going a bit too fast. I ended up going straight over the turning, rolled my car four times and landed on the side. And as it was happening, it all went in slow motion. And it's scary because in that moment of slow motion, you don't know if you're going to come out of it alive. You crash and you're like, oh, wow, I've just survived this. A week later, he crashed again and lost his licence. The impact of this has made him change. Smiling for a photo in the pub, 45 minutes later, two of these friends were dead. My name is Jamie. I've been coming here to this woodland burial ground for many years now. My grandma's buried here, my dad's buried here, and now my younger brother. 25-year-old Jamie Morris fronts a new BBC documentary. His 19-year-old brother, Sammy, was a passenger who died. The documentary explores what happened and looks at how some young men and fast cars have become a lethal combination. Is that another ambulance there? He's obviously left the road, yeah, hit there. Yeah. It was just carnage. I couldn't even tell you what the making model of the car was. This collision will, will stay with me for forever. Um, it's probably one of the worst ones I've... I've, I've been to and I've seen. Chief Constable Joe Shiner of Sussex Police is the national policing lead on road safety. She was speaking on the anniversary of her father's death. He was killed by another driver on the road when she was a teenager. I think we need uh, greater sentencing powers. I also think that the idea around whether you call it progressive driving licences or graduating driving licences really does need to be taken forwards very strongly. Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. Some social media posters have been prosecuted, like this driver who was doing 150 miles per hour. Jamie Morris says the hardest thing for him now is looking to the future without his brother. Thank you for watching. Well, Claudia joins me live in the studio. Now, Claudia, look, what looks like a very powerful documentary there, and there are some really shocking statistics around young male drivers, aren't there? Yes, it's really very worrying indeed. And you're right, Ellie, it's a completely compelling documentary. Now, DVLA data given to the BBC in response to freedom information requests reveals that men under the age of 25 are four times more likely than other drivers to be convicted of dangerous or careless driving. They're also four times more likely to be caught 
drug driving. But the Department for Transport told the BBC it had no plans to introduce further restrictions on younger drivers, even though each year more than 1,500 young drivers are killed or seriously injured on UK roads. Ellie. Claudia, thank you. And you can watch that documentary. It's featured, uh, the one featured in our report. It's called Drive Fast, Die Young. It's available now to watch on iPlayer. And you can also listen to a podcast about it on BBC Sounds. The partner of the Met Police officer Matt Ratner, who was shot dead by a prisoner at Croydon Custody Suite four years ago, says he could still be alive if the gunman had been searched properly. Officers failed to find the gun Louis de Zoyza had in an underarm holster, which killed the former East Grinstead rugby club coach in 2020, despite discovering bullets in his pocket. A property in Ramsgate was one of those targeted by police officers in an operation dedicated to cracking down on county lines drug supply chains. Action across the county resulted in 45 arrests and more than £35,000 in cash was seized. Dozens of residents were forced to leave their homes after a fire broke out in a block of flats in Crawley. Emergency services were called to the scene at Springfield Road in the early hours of this morning. A 44-year-old man has been arrested. Now, for the first time in its history, part of the busiest motorway in the country is going to be shut both ways this weekend. Drivers are being warned to avoid the M25 in the Surrey area. It's part of that upgrade of the motorway's junction at the A3 with the aim to cut delays and collisions. The M25 between junctions 10 and 11 in Surrey will be closed in both directions. That's starting from 9 o'clock tonight until 6 o'clock on Monday morning while a bridge is demolished and a new gantry is installed. This section of the M25 normally carries around 10,000 vehicles every hour during weekends. Well, tonight, the South East Coast Ambulance Service says it's likely to be a challenging weekend for their teams, as Tom Edwards reports. Opened in 1986 by the then Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, the M25 is an orbital motorway encircling London. The aim was to bypass the capital and create a relief road, although it quickly suffered from chronic congestion. Some joked the traffic jams made it Britain's biggest car park. Now it's being redesigned and rebuilt, but that will mean this weekend the first daytime closure of the M25 in its history. And the collisions is the issue, is it here in particular? It, the collisions occur on the approach to both the M25 Junction 10 and also the A3 as it approaches Junction 10. It's just because of the sheer volume of traffic and people changing lanes, often at last minute. So multiple collisions, not generally serious ones, but just the sheer number of them. Today we were given a tour of the construction works. The M25 will be closed this weekend from 9pm on Friday to 8am on Monday between junctions 10 and 11 in Surrey. This is the footbridge that's going to be demolished over the weekend and it'll mean they'll have to shut the M25 the first time they've shut it for that amount of time. Four to 5,000 vehicles every hour use this section of the motorway so you can imagine how bad the disruption is going to be. Transport bosses say it's going to be significant. The scheme has faced opposition, although it has taken 10 years to get to this point and it'll cost £300 million. So it is going to be significant, the disruption here, do you think? I, I mean, if I'm candid, it, it probably will be. It'll be disruptive on some of the local roads because you can't take uh, four lanes of traffic, as you see on the M25, and funnel that all into a single carriageway. So, so long as people are heeding our message and as far as they can, avoiding this part of the country, it'll really help us. This weekend, diversions will be in place through surrounding towns and villages. Drivers are being told to avoid the area unless it's absolutely vital. And more closures are planned for later in the year. Tom Edwards, BBC South East Today. And uh, Matt Graveling has been following this story all day too and he joins us now live from the M25 in Surrey. Matt, I can imagine it's, it's pretty busy there now, but how bad is it going to get this weekend? Well, according to some of the local residents in West Byfleet, which is one of the villages that this diversion will go through, 
very, very busy. They are very worried. Trades people have told me, are they going to do any trade this weekend or just have angry motorists beeping their horn in gridlock? A couple who were getting married, they said to me, are their guests even going to be able to get to their reception? And of course, this is such a busy way to get to Gatwick or Heathrow. Will people be able to get on holiday either? Well, if you are trying to get around and you're going to go into London, don't forget that ULES has not been suspended. But the people who have put on this, uh, this diversion have basically said the advice remains. If you don't have to travel anywhere near the M25, just don't do it. Indeed, Matt, thank you very much. The government says it will be fully supporting a bill to stop young puppies and kittens being smuggled into Britain through our ports and via Eurotunnel. MPs have been debating the changes which would allow a ban on importing dogs and cats younger than six months old. It comes more than two years after the government said it would tighten the rules. Anissa Kadri has more. Just a few weeks ago, Zonic, Leo and Togo were in Romania. Puppies of that age are very vulnerable in, in Romania. The shelters aren't heated, they're not lighted, they, they, they don't have regular, regular veterinary care. Under plans to raise the age dogs, cats and ferrets can come over, they would be too young to be brought over to the UK. Something that worries Rachel, who runs a not-for-profit dog rescue where they're now being looked after. That change is necessary in relation to puppy farming, which is extremely cruel and, and, and there is quite a lot of it, particularly in Eastern Europe, but also further afield. But many have welcomed the move to raise the age from 15 weeks to six months, including this vet based near Canterbury. It is both good for the dogs because they will be travelling at an older age and hopefully it will be much better for potential owners because they will see the sense in taking on a dog from Britain and we can be assured they will not be bringing in exotic diseases. Many of the animals come over via the channel ports, with 116 puppies and kittens quarantined at Dover last year for being too young to be imported, according to government figures. As well as raising the age for import, the bill, which was debated and received government support today, wants to limit the number of puppies people can travel with. We obviously need the enforcement to be uh, to work uh, because very often some of these uh, kind of breeders, they'll put multiple puppies, uh, often from different parents, into a vehicle to get them to the UK to sell them. The bill also aims to stop animals coming over with mutilations illegal in the UK, such as ear cropping, to make a dog appear more intimidating. The details are still to be worked out, but many animal welfare charities say the proposed changes have been long awaited. Anissa Cardry, BBC South East Today. Residents affected by a large landslide say record rainfall has left several homes on the brink of collapse. Two major landslips in Hastings have seen some properties collapse and left others buried with sheds and a swimming pool crumbling away. Today, a number of homeowners met with councillors and demanded immediate action be taken before more homes and gardens are destroyed. Peter Whittlesey has more. A month ago, a landslip affecting these three houses sparked a debate over who is responsible for shoring up the properties. The homeowners or Hastings Borough Council, the landowner of the gill behind, where residents say the cracks first appeared. Today, residents met council officials desperate for action to be taken and questions answered. I'm really angry, but I'm also really tired because I don't understand how a council could have this response, which is we wait and see. I mean, it's fine if you wait and see, but it's not fine if your property is falling down a cliff. Residents are so angry because the council today confirmed it's done nothing and is waiting on instructions from its insurance company. In the meantime, two of the properties can't be lived in because Hastings Borough Council slapped an emergency prohibition order on them. In a statement, the council described the meeting as productive, adding, hopefully we are working with the residents to find a solution as soon as possible. Residents had a very different take on the situation. It's just an ongoing um, nightmare. Today's meeting, hasn't, we haven't really gone any far forward. We're no better off for uh, any more information, really. Residents are so worried they're trying to crowdfund cash to pay for legal and technical experts to help them before their homes slip away. Peter Whittlesey, BBC South East Today, Hastings. It's exactly a quarter to seven, a reminder of our top story tonight. The brother of a 19-year-old who died in a high-speed crash is calling for action to stop young men from killing themselves and others behind the wheel. A BBC investigation has found that young men are far more likely than other drivers to be convicted of dangerous or careless driving. Also in tonight's programme...
On Red Nose Day, Radio 1's Matt Edmondson visits a, visits a Sussex charity winning awards with their help for lonely dads. And the weekend weather is looking a little mixed. We've got some sunshine on Saturday, cloudy skies with some rain on Sunday. I've got the details later in the programme. Virtual reality headsets are being used to calm patients at the Medway Maritime Hospital during minor operations. The Gillingham Hospital is one of the first in the country to use therapeutic VR in this way. As our health correspondent Mark Norman reports, it's giving doctors and patients a whole new perspective on their treatment. What can I see? A big patio area with all grass and a kite in the sky. Um, hang on, oh, there's a building on me right here. Every six weeks, Eric has to undergo interventional surgery to help clear out his kidneys. It can be painful, uncomfortable and tiring. But since the Medway Maritime Hospital introduced virtual reality headsets into its radiology department, Eric has found the whole experience completely different. This is good, isn't it? Can the concentration away from what's ha happening down there. It's weird, I can't explain it. I'm waiting for something to actually happen and stab me again. I was waiting for that. But this time, I didn't, didn't even know they'd started. I can't, I can't explain it. The headsets calm patients, help reduce blood pressure and heart rate, and allow doctors to carry out procedures with less pain and discomfort. With this one, we distract his attention um, from what's going on around him. So basically, he may be in a theater, but his mind is somewhere else. And um, when um, um, the stimulus acts in that way, that it distract them from the pain pathways. We had Eric now for quite a few years. He's always been very anxious. And in the very early days, he always demanded sedation. And I think once we've done it under anaesthetic support, but now we're doing it with no help from anyone except that the arm machine. Uh, am I removing it now, yeah? Oh. Eric enjoyed the beach today. There are other VR experiences available, and in six weeks' time, Eric will be back on a beach somewhere in Gillingham. You know what, today is the first time mm. I felt it. Mark Norman, BBC South East Today, Gillingham. Weird, isn't it? That oh, beach sounds nice about now. Time for some sport and James is live in Canterbury for us this evening with all the latest. Speaking of beach weather, it isn't exactly beach weather, is it, James? You're looking a bit chilly there and hard to believe that cricket season is almost upon us. What? Yeah, absolutely. Only three weeks' time when Kent hosts Somerset in their first county championship game of the season. But more broadly, there are a lot of changes in the pipeline here in Kent cricket. Now, first of all, they bid to make the women's team professional when the format of the game changes in 2025. They actually have got the most successful women's team ever in county cricket and they want them to be in the top tier. Uh, secondly, they've bid to host a third London side in the 100 at their Beckenham ground. Uh, the 100 is of course a, a shorter form of the game with just 100 balls. And on top of all that, well they've got new captains for both the men's and the women's teams. I spoke to them earlier today. And there it is, 300 for Daniel Bell Drummond. Just the fourth a triple century last season, he's a leader with the bat, and now he's been rewarded with the captaincy. Started here at the age of seven, um, junior cricket, so it's an honour, to be honest. And, um, and yeah, family are very proud as well, so no, something that I've dreamed about from a young age, really. And um, some great names in the past, Rob Key, Billings, Fulton, people like that, so hopefully I can... I can put a stamp on things and be a successful captain myself. He's taken over from Sam Billings, who remains the captain of the T20 team, a shorter form of the sport, but he also plays abroad and has just become a father. A bit of life balance needed, uh, obviously not getting any younger. And I, I think the amount of cricket that certainly I play, not only here at Kent, but also around the world uh, during the winter as well. Um, yeah, it, it just felt unsustainable to play all, all three formats. Um, so to focus in on the T20 stuff uh, and really give everything um, kind of is a natural fit for me. 
But as they prepare for the new season, there's an even bigger change than the captaincy on the horizon. The South East Stars are a professional women's team with players from Kent and Surrey, playing at Kent's ground in Beckenham. But next year, the regional system will be replaced by a county-based league, and Kent have bid to be part of it. And that means the women's team should be going pro. Kent cricket being professional, I think, will be amazing. Um, and I think having the opportunity to play for Kent, and obviously if you're coming through the pathways, you want something like a reward at the end. Um, so I think the girls coming through the pathway can then see that they have the opportunity to actually be paid to play for Kent, so which is great. They were fighting relegation last season, but it feels like a new era here, with change both in the boardroom and on the field. After a long, wet winter, they'll hope for a brighter start in April. On to other sport now, because Brighton and Hove Albion's European adventure sadly is over. They hosted Roma in the... At the end of the day, we've got this far. You can't ask for more, really, from a club like this. It's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, and we got to see it. Slightly depressing. I mean, good to get a goal, obviously, but just missed so many chances. Hopefully making a bit of history, but they gave it a good go, so, um, yeah, we were happy. It was a great game. You yeah. know what? When I left, 1-0. What an yeah. effort. Look ahead at the weekend football now because uh, Gillingham host Grimsby Town as they hope to stay in the playoff places. In the Women's Super League, Brighton and Hove Albion, they've got Manchester City. And in the Women's Championship, Lewis, who are second from bottom of the table, face Watford, who are bottom of the table with one point less than them and a game in hand. So that is going to be a key fixture as Lewis bid to avoid relegation this season. Thank you very much, James. Thank you. Now, it's Red Nose Day, and thank you for getting in touch to tell us how you've been fundraising. One of the charities who has funding from Comic Relief is Dad La Soul, an innovative group with bases in Lewis, Brighton and Worthing, helping to battle social isolation for fathers. Radio One star Matt Edmondson, who grew up on the South Coast, has been to visit the multi-award winning project in Sussex. <music> I'm a proud father to seven-year-old Ivy and two-year-old Willow. They mean the absolute world to me, but being a parent is a bit of an adjustment and at times it's been a bit of a struggle. 10 years ago, I was diagnosed with cyclothymia. It means I can ride a wave of mood swings. So sometimes I feel fantastic and I get loads done. But on the flip side, I can have very dark times where I feel depressed and anxious. It's a disorder that I suspect my dad also had, but sadly went undiagnosed because in 2008, when I was just 22 years old, he lost his life to suicide. Now I found with my own mental health journey that it's been so helpful for me to be able to talk to someone, but not everyone is as fortunate. And actually for men, for dads, it can be a challenge. In 2022, there were over five and a half thousand suicides in England and Wales and around three quarters of those were male. Dan Flanagan set up Dad La Soul in 2016. Why did you set it up? When I was about six, my dad was awarded custody of me and my three sisters. So I sort of grew up seeing the abject lack of support there was for dads. And then uh, when I became a dad myself, yeah, I was really, really struggling. And I just I wanted some mates. What I've sort of realised is through, I think we're on event 400 and something now. It's that middle-aged men, or men in general, won't talk about their feelings. Now they've got a, a space and a community where out comes the whatever they need to get off their shoulders, and there's a lovely ready-made support network out there for them. Dad La Soul hosts many different events which offer opportunities for men to talk with or without their children, from puppet shows to swimming. Have you noticed a difference because of the cost of living, because people have less money to spend. If people are on low or no wage, you can come along for free. That's one of the, the benefits of working with organisations like Comic Relief that can subsidise those. You can come along, take part in any of the activities you want. Tyler has been attending Dad La Soul events for eight years. He's dad to two boys. I'm quite good at putting up a mask. I suppose I didn't want to be vulnerable. And it got to the point where I was desperate and I was crying for help. What feeling do you get on the day that you know you've got a Dad La Soul event? It gives dads like me an opportunity to have a trusted space um, and it gives us a chance to 
take care of ourselves and ultimately the people that we love in our life. Discussing mental health can be hard, but dads don't have to battle it alone. If dad or soul didn't exist, what do you think the impact would be if those dads didn't have somewhere to go? I think there would be a lot more children that are setting up charities in the memory of their dads. The bottom line, dadless soul saves lives. We are equipping these men with the emotional support they need to continuously get through another day. I wish something like it had existed for my dad. I wish he could have come and been involved in, in something like this and had some people to talk to. Matt Edmondson reporting there and Comic Relief is starting in just a few minutes. Stick with us here on BBC One and you can see it on, of course on BBC iPlayer. Now time for a look at the weekend weather. Nina Ridge is with us and it, I feel like changeable <laughs> is the word that we're going to go with. No, it just can't make up its mind. It was very mild yesterday. It's not been quite as mild today. A little breezy, cloudy skies, but there are signs of spring out there. And I think as we go through the weekend, we'll continue to see that weather chopping and changing. Certainly on Saturday at the moment, we're going to see some dry and bright weather. Then a weather front moves through overnight. So it leaves behind cloudy skies at first on Sunday with some rain and that's courtesy of this weather front may just still linger first for the first part of Sunday but it is forecast then clear away so through the day the weather will improve as it gradually turns drier and brighter still a few showers out there for a time this evening but they are clearing and as we head in towards the early hours the winds are falling a little lighter and so temperatures will dip down to around about four to five degrees first thing tomorrow morning we'll get off the weekend with some sunshine and then the clouds starts to increase as we go through the day so slightly more overcast for the second half of the day but it should be dry the winds will be lighter than they have been through the day today although temperatures just a little down we've got highs of 12 degrees maybe 13 it's then that weather front arrives for the evening and overnight. At first, the rain is pretty patchy and light, but as we head to the first part of Sunday morning, the rain is going to turn a little heavier. And of course, it's not as cold, so temperatures on Sunday morning, eight or nine. So whilst we may start off on Sunday cloudy and wet, things will improve. The rain moves away from parts of East Kent. The cloud will break up. We'll see some sunshine for the second half of the day with temperatures maybe at 15 degrees, Ellie. Well, that's positive. Absolutely balmy, isn't it? Thank you, Nina. We'll take that. That is it from me and from Nina and from everybody here. Linda Hardy is back at 10.30. Bye.